Hi everyone. Um, my name is Lauren Erdman. Um, I'm actually uh, so I'm I'm in my PhD, but I'm on a year off uh, working on a data science group at SickKids. Um, I have a master's in uh, computer science and a master's in biostatistics, and I focused focused on a lot of problems, uh, particularly applying machine learning to genomic and genetic data, and also clinical data. Um, and so a lot of what we do in the lab is um, in my supervisor, Dr. Goldenberg's lab, is. Uh, integration of all these different data types. So here in this first slide you can see many and these are just a subset of all the data types we work with and we thought it would be appropriate to end the, uh, the whole workshop with this because you've seen a lot of different data types, you've seen a lot of different uses and a lot of different methods um, for it and uh, I'm hoping to kind of tie it all together um, and talk about kind of the implementation of this, how you can apply it to your own data and how we've done it ourselves as well. Um, so first thing um, so just some learning objectives. We're going to go over some clinical data that we work with um, and talk about like a quick review of single data type analysis just to uh, place or bench uh, integrative analyses in that framework. Um, and then I'm going to talk about different data integration methods, a subset. There are so many different ones, so um, by no means is this an exhaustive list. And then uh, we'll discuss some advantages and drawbacks, and maybe you'll come up with some of your own as well, beyond what I've listed again. And then we'll go over some uh, survival analysis, because that's been spoken about a lot. Um, and then in the lab, we're going to implement um, both the data integration and survival analysis, so you can see more concretely how it's done um, and how you might apply it to your own work. So first, clinical data. There's so much. This is, again, by no means exhaustive, but um, but in this context, this is what I'm referring to when I'm uh, referring to clinical data. So things like sex, family history, uh, tumor staging and size, age of diagnosis, and time to recurrence, for example. And <clears throat> oftentimes, you want to integrate these to get some useful prediction or some understanding of the underlying disease. So. Um, here's just an example, but uh, there are many of these available. Again, um, this is a prediction tool uh, for breast cancer survival, and you can input all these different uh, details about your breast cancer, and you can see um, how you would survive, uh, how likely are you to survive a, a different time lapse. So again, there's so many different patient data, though, um, and it's just a shame not to leverage all of this. So. Um, one example, and it's been talked about uh, even by Molly in the previous talk, uh, is the Cancer Genome Atlas. They have all different kinds of data, um, and theoretically it would be very useful to integrate this and understand what's going on um, on a more meta level uh, that involves all of these different things because they're all part of the same system, right? Um, and so why would we do this? Well, here's just some, uh, a few points. but to identify more homogeneous subsets of patients. So if you can cut your patients more ways, you can find smaller maybe subsets and uh, subsets that are homogeneous against many different data types. So uh, subsets that are defined by a similar methylome pattern or a similar pattern in genome, gene expression. Um, and maybe you want to ensure that both of those are the same. So you want to integrate both of those data types into identifying those subtypes. Um, and then also uh, to help better uh, do prediction. And we'll discuss, of course, uh, what that would involve. So just some single data type analysis, and this has been talked about actually a lot uh, during this course and even in the last talk. So you've got a single data type and you want to see if that is going to split your patients in some meaningful way, right? So this is a classic. We've got a heat map here of gene expression. Uh, here we've performed hierarchical clustering and you see there's a difference. You just test with a t-test if you want. You could also look at survival curves for this. So um, here's another way you can see, oh, like does this differentiate my patients in some clinically important way? Um, so we're all very familiar with this. This is classic. Um, but to get in, to just segue from this into the survival analysis, um, when we're using these in a survival context, what we're evaluating is these two KM curves. So Robin earlier was talking about the Kaplan-Meier survival curves, um, and I just want to go in more concretely in depth about like how to interpret them, what they mean. Um, so here we've got GBM group one and GBM group two, and you can see that uh, in the past slide, these were defined by the uh, clusters that were uh, discovered through this hierarchical, cluster, hierarchical clustering of uh, GBM gene expression. 
And in group one, um, can anyone tell me if their prognosis or survival is better or worse? Better. better, yes. Okay, so the way you can tell is, if you just look at any of these lines, actually, so I'm going to try to use this here. So uh, the easiest way is to look at the median line, but really any line you draw, the key is that uh, half the people have died, or in this case, they've died, um, or they've experienced an event um, at this point, so at about, yeah, not even half a year. Um, and then in this other group, they've survived much longer. So half of them have died just after two years. So it's easy to see from that context. If you just slice it, you can see, oh, one group that has a way better prognosis than the other group. So it seems that they've picked up on some signature that's meaningful for survival. Another way to look at it is uh, you can slice it from the year. So you can say, okay, at one year, what share of the group two uh, here has uh, is surviving versus what share of group one um, and you can see that it's about it's 80 percent 90 percent for group one and group two is terrible it's around 20 percent so obviously much worse prognosis and another interesting point and actually a very important aspect excuse me of uh, survival analysis is the ability to integrate uh, censored observations into your data. So these are actually missing observations. No event has occurred that you've observed. So uh, we can still use that information that a person has survived up to that point um, into your analysis. So this makes survival analysis actually quite powerful for predicting prognosis. Um, and we'll talk about that a little more in depth. Uh, in the survival analysis section. So another single data type driven uh, integration, uh, so it's not a single data type analysis, but it's analysis that's driven by uh, a single data type initially. So maybe you have, um, you've measured gene expression. So you have your mRNA here and you discover some subtypes. Then you look at mutations and you decide to add more genes into your gene expression analysis. Then you decide, oh, but there's copy number variation as well. So I think I'm interested in the gene expression of these people as well. So you have many different data types informing what genes you include, but at the end of the day, it's still just gene expression, for example. So there's ways to integrate in this way where it's, it's kind of sums up to a, a filtering process. Um, but at the end of the day, it really is a single data type that you're analyzing um, in this context. So We've in this uh, example, they didn't include methylation data. And the problem is when you're doing this, when you're doing this filtering um, for each individual data type and you're saying, OK, I want to include gene expression. I want to only analyze gene expression, but I want to filter my genes and add them iteratively. Um, you're not including information about other data types that may be important. So here, even though you're including the CMV information uh, in terms of what genes expression you include, you're not directly including that CMV information. Likewise, with mutations, you're not directly including that. You're just filtering through them. So it's nice to have a more direct way to include them. Um, and what people have done is just done the clustering like they did on... Um, the gene expression, they just do it then on methylation, and then they put it against the genes expression. Um, but here, yeah, so, so again, there's many different ways that people have kind of done this in a piecewise fashion, um, and now I'm going to talk about more direct integration approaches, where people just took the data from different data types and put it actually together, integrated it into a single analysis, and then took from that uh, to um, kind of associate it with some prognostic indicator. So the first one, so we're going to go through concatenate and cluster. Uh, we're going to go through iCluster, a very famous one. And then we're also going to go through similarity network fusion, which was uh, created in our lab. Um, and again, is it's a, they're all different flavors of a very similar problem being solved in a different way. So concatenation. This one's really simple. You just take your two or uh, whatever number of data types and you just squash them together. And now you cluster them. So I'm gonna quickly talk about hierarchical clustering here. So you concatenate and then you hierarchically cluster. When you have a hierarchical clustering problem, you generate a distance matrix. And the idea of the distance matrix is um, each of these, so here you have D and F. So these are people, say. Um, person D and person F are more similar to each other 
than anyone else in here. This is the lowest point. So they're going to be the first pair that's clustered together. And that's what hierarchical clustering does. Pairwise, it looks for who is the most similar to each other, and it puts them in the same clusters as you go. So it actually doesn't cluster at all. It, it just creates a hierarchy of who's most similar. So as you can see from this distance matrix, uh, how that ends up looking is this. So you've got your first pairing here, then your next pairing here, and your next pairing here. And it's pairing actually with the group, as you can see. So they're put together, and then they're paired off again. right? So you can see how it's not actually clustered, um, it's actually just made into some hierarchy of the distances. And then you have to cut that at some point. And we'll discuss some ways that you can choose uh, what cluster number you uh, decide on, um, which is really nice that Molly talked about that as well. And I'm going to talk about some different ways you can do that. Um, so here, yeah, deciding the number of clusters. So you could cut the dendrogram. That's what this, uh, this guy here is called. You can cut the dendrogram by eye. Um, so here, if you were going to cut this by eye, how many clusters do you think this would have? Two. Yeah, probably two. Like, it seems like, and the way you would do that is say, okay, this is a really long line here, and this is really long here, so it seems like these guys are pretty different from each other, so it seems like there's maybe two distinct groups, right? Um, that's really hard to write up in a paper. Uh, so it's nice to have some metrics um, and some numbers that you can put on something. So uh, another one, the silhouette statistic. So what the silhouette statistic does is it takes your distance within the cluster and compares it to the distances in all the other clusters from your individuals. And so what that's doing is saying, um, does it make sense to have these people in their own cluster or are they actually quite similar to everyone who's nearby them as well? Am I cutting clusters in half? Am I cutting a cloud of data in half? Or are these actually separate groups? So um, this is an example. Uh, <laughs> these slides are actually, parts of them are from my supervisor. So um, this one in particular, I'm not totally great at communicating. But basically, so there's three clusters. There's different examples here of um, some data. So you have three clusters in two dimensions. So this seems like all right. Like, uh, I definitely think this guy's a cluster. These ones, I mean, this guy's pretty close to that guy, right? So it's like um, where you drew that line, it seems legitimate, but maybe not. This one seems like, so this one is six clusters in two dimensions. So we've got two measurements on these people, and we've cut them into these six clusters. The problem is this guy definitely seems distinct. Like this cluster seems extremely distinct. But these ones, does it make sense to have them in a separate cluster? Likewise with these ones, they seem like actually it's just three clusters, right? So um, what, silhou what a silhouette statistic can do is actually distinguish those. So you can see for A, the silhouette statistic is very high. Oh, sorry, this is the accuracy. But the hmm. So the silhouette statistic is green here. And it says percent accuracy, but the silhouette statistic is going to be quite high. It's For this first one, it's going to be more different than for this one, where you're actually slicing what seems to be one cluster into multiple. And that's and that's the, in, uh, the intuition behind this. You want to discover if you're actually just kind of arbitrarily cutting up your data. Um, and I don't know if you guys have been in this situation. I've done a lot of clustering. And a lot of times, you really want there to be subtypes in your data, but like they just don't exist. And this is a great way to just be like, am I just splitting a data cloud into arbitrary numbers of groups? And like, is that useful? And, and if you are splitting them into these groups, it's, you're doing yourself a disservice if you're trying to do prediction, because if it is just one data cloud, then the continuous valued information, like not the, the categorical descriptions, is much more informative. So you don't want to be pushing yourself into a subtype analysis when you really don't need to be and your data doesn't support it. Um, and so a silhouette statistic is an easy way to just say, nope, you know what, uh, I, I don't have data that supports this. Another way, so a lot of times, I just wanted to talk about this graph. This is a pretty classic silhouette graph. And what this is uh, a silhouette statistic graph. And what this is showing you is this is the silhouette statistic on the x-axis. And these are the subtypes. So this is subtype 1, this is subtype 2 here, and this is subtype 3 here. And what you can see is um, each bar is one individual in the cluster. 
And so it seems like these guys, when you have a negative silhouette, it means that you should actually be maybe in a different cluster. Like you're very similar to people who are outside your group and you're not, you're kind of similar to people in your group, but not very much so. Um, and so here it kind of points to like, oh, well, it seems like there's some really nice clustering in these ones, but these ones seem like there may be some admixture from this first cluster into these ones. So it's, it's nice to see this and say like, how much does my data support a clustering? And if you have a lot of data points lying on this side and very high on this side, then it's supportive of clustering. Um, but I've seen a lot of data where most of it is on the negative side or near negative or near zero even, and your data just then, it doesn't support a subtype analysis. Um, so this is a really nice check to do upstream just to save your own sanity so that when you've done your clusters and then you go back and look and discover that you don't have clusters in your data, um, you, you will have avoided that. All right, consensus clustering. So consensus clustering uh, sums up to just resampling from your data. So this is another way to see like, am I reliably putting people together or do my cluster divisions just rely on having certain people in the data set? Do I have some outlier group that's driving my clustering discovery or do I actually have clusters that exist among everyone? Um, and so you just resample, you cluster again, and you just compute the number of times each group or each pair of individuals is clustering together. And that's a nice thing to check uh, for stability of your clustering, stability of your data in a clustering framework, actually, more specifically. So now back to our different integrative clustering approaches. So I cluster. Um, so iCluster, what it does is it looks for latent subtypes. Uh, it assumes that your data ha follows a Gaussian latent uh, variable model. Um, and then the sparsity regularization isn't very important here. But basically what you're trying to find is uh, a latent embedding. So what that means is you're basically trying to find labels that exist across all your different data types. And so you want to see if you can divide up your sample into these subtypes, maybe you have like four subtypes, and you say, okay, yep, this subtype exists here, 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 and here. And sometimes it can be supported by one uh, data type more than the other, for example, which is nice, but um, at the end of the day, it's just looking for a continuity in subtype discovery across these different data types. So some drawbacks of this is um, in this uh, I cluster, it's very computationally intensive. Um, I think they've overcome that in uh, more recent iterations in, in part, but it's at the end of the day, it still is a very computationally intensive uh, algorithm. Um, so that what that actually ends up uh, amounting to is, oops, sorry, I'm on the wrong slide. Yeah, no, um, what that amounts to is you just are restricted in the amount of data you can put into the algorithm. So what you can use is limited, and if you want to do some whole genome analysis or something, you cannot. You can only use about 1,500 to like maybe 3,000 genes, um, which for certain diseases is a massive limitation. Um, there are many steps uh, to take, and um, there's a signal. Sorry, I'm just going to see if any of these other things are very relevant. Right. So, and the other thing is, it's focusing on similarity across the data types. So here where I look, when I told you, it's looking for subtypes where it's like, okay, uh, having these four subtypes, it's supported in this data type and this data type. But if maybe this data type actually shows three subtypes and this data type shows four, maybe there's a subtype that only really exists in the microRNA space. Maybe you would only discover that in microRNA. And so you want to integrate often that complementary information because only one genomic data type, for example, would show that information. Um, so that can end up being a major constraint. So enter similarity network fusion. Um, and the idea of this is, so you construct patient similarity matrices and then you fuse multiple matrices. But uh, what that ends up looking like is, so you have your um, data here, patients by gene expression. And what you do is you create a similarity matrix of uh, these patients. So you find like these, this group is very similar to each other. This, these two people are very similar to each other. Um, and you put it in that space. That space actually is a network. So 
each of these points here actually represent an edge between uh, each of these patients. So a node here is a patient and an edge is the link or the affinity or similarity between those patients. So here a darker, uh, a darker node here corresponds to a darker edge here. Um, and so what you would do is you create a similarity network out of each one of your data types and then you fuse them uh, iteratively and you create a fused similarity network. So the fusion is similar to uh, what Robin was actually talking about this morning about graph diffusion. So what you're actually doing is you're diffusing the different data types onto each other and you're doing it iteratively which means that which means you're doing it a lot of times but more importantly what it means is you're doing it on each of them um, in, in sequence, like in a cycle, so that they're becoming more and more similar with every iteration. And then once they reach a level of similarity uh, between them that is uh, very high, or the difference between the different fused networks, sorry, the difference between the different diffused on networks is very small, then you can combine them into this fused similarity network. And now you have a network that it, it exists or it represents information from all your data types and um, that information integrated is both common and complementary. So you're integrating um, like in the iCluster framework where you're saying, I want to see that these subtypes exist. Like if there's a subtype uh, breakdown that exists across multiple data types, I really want to boost that signal. But also if there's a subtype signal that only exists in one data type, I also want to keep that information. If it's a very strong division in my data, that's probably important and, and something that I don't want to wash out when I'm um, fusing everything. So, oh yeah. How do you fix the cutoff for connection? So the cutoff the cut for... For connection in your, in your network. Oh, so you don't... Uh, you don't have to pick the cutoff. Uh, so what we did was um, we actually do spectral clustering and we use the eigengaps algorithm. Mm -hmm. Oh, we don't, yeah. So we, we convert it into a network that is fully connected. So that's another benefit. You don't have to cut at any point. So the network is just this full graph here. So you keep all the information. You're not cutting it into chunks. Why don't you connect P1 and P2? Yeah, so these all have a link between them. It doesn't show it here, but theoretically, all of these have a link. And uh, the links represent the weight in this. So they represent the cell value here. So there's no cutoff. We don't cut it at all. So in, yeah, I don't, I don't love this uh, um, animation because yeah, this is linked. They're all linked. So it's all like who connected yep. Uh, yep. Yep. So you're integrating all the information from all the data types in terms of their similarity, the patient similarity. So it's just that the link can be stronger or weaker. Yep. Exactly. Yeah. So it's safe to say that P1 and P2 are least similar in this entire. Yeah. Network. Yeah. Exactly. And in this, you can see uh, P1 and P2 seem to not be very similar, I think. Yeah. Um, I'm not sure how much was done. Sorry, again, this particular slide is not mine. Um, I'm not sure how much was done to make this exactly this. Um, but know that uh, these, all these weights exist. But uh, neutron data sets may have a, like, a neutron contribution to mm -hmm. the final Network. Yes, yeah. So we don't, yeah, you can weight them. We actually haven't um, used a weighting method for this because the hard thing is, it's hard to know, like, do I want to upweight? So, for example, here, would you want to upweight your methylation, your uh, expression, or your microRNA expression, your gene expression, or your microRNA expression, right? Like, which one would you want to weight higher or lower? Um, so right now, we just weight them all equally. And then some, what you'll see here is some have, like this guy, it's a very diffuse signal. Um, and so what happens is this one won't contribute as much to the fuse matrix. Because if, if it's just noise going in, um, it's not going to differentiate the patients very much. 
So even when you're diffusing noise onto the network, um, it's, it is just that. It is just noise, so it's, it doesn't contribute to any clustering. Um, and so after you've done the uh, similarity network fusion, you can actually see um, how much each one of the individual networks contributed to the fusion. Um, and you would use uh, normalized mutual information that Molly described earlier. Um, so you would see uh, if I did that same clustering in this data type versus the clustering in the fuse matrix, um, how similar are those clusterings? How similar is the membership in each of those groups um, between the fuse matrix and the um, the uh, individual data type. So here, yeah, so here you can see that the signal is boosted in an extreme way, actually. Um, and so where you would have a very diffuse signal here, it seems, and it seems like there's about, I don't know, like four, five different uh, subtypes here. This looks like maybe like a very similar subtype and a pretty diffuse one here, and then some noise down here. This one just looks like pure noise. You're able to boost the signal and flesh out the noise um, when you're integrating these, when you're diffusing these networks on each other. So some clinical properties of these subtypes um, can be evaluated. Yeah? Uh, but then after, after you have the final matrix, actually, the fused one, so I mean, from, from this example, it's very clear, but how do you actually mathematically define the number of clusters here? Yes, so um, so now you have an affinity matrix um, and you can convert it to a distance matrix or keep it as an affinity matrix and you can use all those clustering algorithms that are just applied. So hierarchical clustering, um, spectral clustering, um, literally you name it, all it needs is a distance matrix or an affinity matrix to be input for it. So you can use all of those. In this framework, we found spectral clustering works best. And because of that, we found eigengaps is the best uh, tool to evaluate that, um, just because you're evaluating the spectrum when you're using eigengaps. Um, but you can use hierarchical clustering here. You can use really anything. You can, you can just look by like you can eyeball it and say there's three clusters and split them as well, right? Um, but at the end of the day, actually, you get a full network out of this. You get a full um, distance matrix or similarity matrix, if you will. Um, and so you can use that in any way you want. Um, so I'm actually going to talk about a few ways that's been used. Um, and then you can look at clinical properties of the subtypes. Oh, yeah. So do all patients have all three data types? Yes, data yes. So ideally, yes. Um, if they don't, if you impute it, then it comes with all the like classic imputation issues that everyone faces. Um, it can be imputed. And what's interesting is you can impute it in the raw data itself, or you can impute um, on, in the similarity space. Um, so we can impute these, in, these matrices themselves. But at the end of the day, um, you'll want to have a comparison. Uh, if you impute, you want to have a comparison of that result with the result on your complete data set, uh, if it's at all possible, because it's hard to know how much of what you discover is going to be an artifact of, the, of your imputation. Um, and so, especially when you come out with some tight clusters, um, it's kind of like, okay, well, are they actually very similar or did I make them all similar because I imputed them and, I, and that imputation was done based on the similarity of these patients to each other, so. Can you really quickly explain imputation? Yes, yeah, absolutely. So imputation can be done in a lot of ways. Um, there's uh, some classic ones are just a linear regression. So you, you run a regression on everyone who you have data for and then you use the values that you uh, ran the regression on to predict the value, uh, the missing value for people you don't have the data on. So a real big issue here is let's say we want to, we don't have any methylation data for certain people, but we have their gene expression and their microRNA. Well, if we use their gene expression and their microRNA to impute their DNA methylation, now we're making them similar yeah. to each other. We're making that we're making that signal penetrate across those different data types. And um, then their imputed methylation data would group them in the same way as mRNA and microRNA. Exactly. Yeah, their methylation becomes a function of those other data yeah. types. So uh, you you just constructed uh, basically a similarity. So ideally you would have same data for all patients, or yep. can you have some patients where you do not have DNA 
So yeah, ideally you would have the same data for all patients. Yeah. yeah. And if you have missing data, ideally you would have some of the data. So it, in the DL, DNA methylation uh, space, suppose you're missing like some portion of their DNA methylation, then um, it that's easier to impute because then you can impute it from other DNA methylation um, and you're not relying on the other data types now um, to impute it. Because yeah, I think the, the most important thing to keep in mind with imputation is like what signal am I propagating and, and what am I going to probably rediscover at the end in my results once I've imputed this data set, yeah. right? Because you might just be constructing the results you end up getting. Yeah. Um, another way to impute, and actually this is, um, it actually it has a lot of the similar uh, issues as uh, regression, but you could even do like K nearest neighbors. So you could say, you know, find the, the five people who are most similar to this person. Now let's let them vote um, on what my missing value should be. For example, so there's there's many different ways to do it. There's full books, like volumes, written about imputation. But um, at the end of the day, it's just important to know you're predicting your values, and so you might be creating your end result. Um, and so the, what's nice about uh, the subtypes versus the network space is you can split up your data, of course, and you can see if there's any clinically actionable or interesting aspects about these people. So um, if you look at their survival probability and you split them into two subtypes uh, or into multiple subtypes here, then you can say like, oh, well, it seems like this group is pretty similar to this other group here, but this group uh, seems to be doing well. Like they seem to have like a, a better prognosis. So um, that may be interesting. Um, you can look at uh, their age. You can see if there's something that may be driving the differences as well, because um, likely your location of where you live or your age or different things, these will also be driving differences in your data. And so it's important to discover even artifacts this way. So it's uh, nice to look at your batch, for example, um, uh, when you're looking at your subtypes after the fact, because your batch may be driving your whole subtype discovery. Um, and again, like that's not necessarily useful. <laughs> um, so we did this in TCGA data. We applied SNF to this. Um, and uh, we included gene expression, methylation, microRNA, um, and we had some controls here. Oh, yeah. So these are cancer patients, and then we had normal data here. Um, and we just looked at, like, if we're clustering them, uh, this is putting the clusters in a latent space here, um, so the principal components. So we took the PCA of the data, and we colored it by which cluster you belong to. Um, and we saw that it was really interesting. You could see uh, where they lie close to each other, or maybe they're kind of on a spectrum and they're being divided up. Um, and so in this one, where they seem to not be very different, well, they also seem to be pretty similar, at least in some of the space here. And in this one, where they are also very different, they don't seem to necessarily be extremely different. Like this space doesn't necessarily translate into the clinical space. So that's another thing that's very important. Um, this is unsupervised and only based on the genomic and genetic data or whatever data you put in, actually. We put in nutrition data, neuroimaging data, like you can really do it with anything, but your clusters you find might not clinically be very important. Like I said, they could be batch, they could be age, they could be sex. So it's very important to look at all these things and say like, did my clustering make sense and, and is it important too? So there's some advantages and disadvantages, some of which I've already discussed, but um, it's nice because you can have some integrative feature selection. Uh, like I was saying about uh, choosing which one is, or, or seeing after the fact, which data type was most important. Another thing you might want to know is, were any particular genes most important? And so you, again, through uh, normalized mutual information, you can see if a particular gene seems to be driving uh, the clustering or if you have a certain group of genes that are most important for separating out your patients into these different subtypes. And so it's a nice way to do some feature selection if those subtypes end up being clinically important. Um, and growing the network requires extra work. So it's network space, so that's n squared time. So um, it can take a lot of time if you have several thousand uh, patients that you're trying to create a fuse similarity network out of, um, you'll want to have some processing power to do that. Um, and again, like what I said before, it's unsupervised. 
and it's hard, it's very hard to turn this into a supervised problem because it's a nonlinear fusion. So you are seeing just like what exists in your data. Um, you're not saying what exists in my data that's associated with survival, right? So if you don't include something in the clustering, then it's not going to drive the clustering and your clustering may or may not correspond to survival or um, tumor location or anything that you would be particularly interested in. Um, but some nice things, it has, it creates a unified view of patients in multiple heterogeneous data spaces. So if you have nutrition data, for example, that you want to integrate with microRNA data, um, you'll have a common space to do that in. They won't, they don't both map to a gene or anything like that, um, which can be extremely challenging. And there's no need to do any gene pre-selection, um, and it's robust to different types of noise. So survival analysis. Now we're going to switch gears pretty dramatically here. Um, so I'm going to talk about hazard rates, survival functions, uh, the KM is estimator or Kaplan-Meier estimator, the log rank test, uh, which also Robin brought up, like very nicely uh, set me up for, and then um, and then we'll talk about the Cox proportional hazards ratio model. Um, and a key thing here is actually. I'm going to talk about Cox proportional hazards, but uh, there's also a whole class of survival analysis that deals with parametric survival functions. Um, and those are extremely powerful for actually predicting the time. So if you're interested in when are you going to die, or when are you going to have a, your cancer onset, or when are you going to have a relapse, then a parametric model actually may be more appropriate. So I just wanted to point that out because Cox is commonly used, but um, I, I, this, I don't know if this is totally true, but um, I've seen it in multiple places. Even Cox preferred the parametric survival models to his own model because, because of your ability to estimate when will this thing happen, not just how likely is it, how, what's your hazard rate at any given point. So we'll talk more about that. So survival data, it's time to a, an event. It can be a single event. So here it says single event, but it could also be multiple events. It could be competing risks. That's another type of survival model where you're saying, okay, either you're gonna die or you're gonna get a relapse and you wanna see which one's gonna happen first. And if you die, then you probably won't have relapse, right? So they're competing risks. Um, and some, and the nice thing is some data on patients may be missing, um, and so it's censored, generally speaking, um, when it's missing, and you can still incorporate that data into your model. So if you know at what point you no longer have information on that patient, you can say, well, they lived up to this point, or they had no onset up to this point, and then that information can be integrated into the model, um, and you've not totally lost that sample. So it's, it's pretty flexible and powerful in that way. So just some, just to look at it, um, here's the beginning of our study, and each one of these is an individual case. So we've got one, two, three, four, five here. Um, and let's say this is the end of our study. So these guys are going to be censored. We don't know when they have um, their event, whatever it would be, right? Um, and so with these ones, we can integrate this information into the model. But here we know, okay, this person had an event at uh, month one, a month three here, month four here, and then when you do your survival analysis, you can actually see, do, do the people who had this earlier onset, are they separate from the people who never had an onset or a later onset or later death? So some important statistics. First, event time, T. Time is pretty important for these models. Our survival function, so the survival function I mean, it makes sense intuitively. It's the probability that you're alive at a given time, right? The hazard rate, that's the probability of, a, of whatever event happening, so dying, failure, uh, cancer onset, at that instant or in the next instant, um, more importantly. So um, it's your instantaneous likelihood of experiencing an event. So some examples, constant hazard rate. So it's not changing over time. At any given time, you're equally as likely to experience an event. A positive hazard rate, I mean, this is something we're all familiar with. Um, as you age, you're more likely to have, for example, cancer onset, right? So uh, it increases over time. A negative hazard rate, um, dying risk is highest at birth, infant mortality, um, or <laughs> like what I like to think of this is as like, 
um, if you're male, you leave adolescence. And now that you've passed adolescence, you're more likely to live for a period of time, right? Like there's periods of time where you're at high risk and then you, the risk drops off given that you've already lived that amount of time, right? So it's a non-constant hazard ratio. <laughs> All right, so the KM estimator, this is classic and very important um, for uh, survival analyses. And um, so we've got the survival function, we've got the probability uh, that a member from a given population will have a lifetime at or exceeding that time. Um, and so here's the function that actually estimates it. Um, it's not too important because I think the actual graph is very much more intuitive to understand. You're really just counting. Um, and each step here represents some failure or some event that's occurred, right? So up to this point, an event, and you drop down. Now in this population, this is the share of people that are alive or have not experienced an event. And uh, this difference is the share of people who have. And then here you have your censored observations included. So you know that at least one person lived, at, lived or didn't experience an event up to this point. And it's a really easy way to just see like, wow, these are really different. Right, so it's a it's a very intuitive way to show your results. Can I ask a question? Yes, please. Yeah. So why is it that the red curve will drop after the the black dot? I don't remember what you called it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The censored observation. Yeah. So because it's not observed what has happened to them. So all you say, all, the only information that you integrate into this is um, the fact that nothing has happened up to that point. And that's the key thing with censored observations. Nothing has happened to them. You don't know, did they, they could have had something, uh, they could have had an event onset here, like right after it. We don't know, we just are missing that information. But we know they at least lived, or at least had nothing happen to them up to that point. So that's why it stays a constant through that and then drops only when we observe a failure or a death or an event. So the drop is, the drop, the exact time you observe uh, Exactly. Yeah. Yes. So every drop here is an observed failure, an observed onset. All right. So this one actually it used to be hidden, but then uh, Robin talked about uh, the log rank test. So I'm not going to go into all of this, but what I basically want to say is um, what we're doing here with these log rank tests, where we're testing the difference in the KM curves, is we're just doing a Gaussian estimation with that data. So you can use that to approximate a z-score and get a p-value um, for the difference between your curves. So that's, that's what it boils down to if you need any intuition about what the log rank test is. Um, so I just wanted to touch on that briefly just because it was brought up earlier. And I think it's very important because KM curves are used all the time. And it's very nice to know uh, when you're using a Gaussian approximation, for example, because that's asymptotic, which means that if you have a very low sample size, this may not be a very powerful way to test the differences. Um, and it will become more powerful and more appropriate as your sample size grows. So. Is there like a limit on how long we're saying you have less than mm. this number of samples than you should be using? Um, it depends on your data. Uh, so because if you have fewer samples, it, it's more like a, a power question. If you have fewer samples um, and they're extremely distinct, uh, then you calling it significant is okay. It's going to build pretty big confidence intervals, which is nice um, in that case because you won't be very confident with few observations, but you're more likely to get a nice difference. Um, yeah, so I, I would think of it more in a power context. Yeah, it's hard to put numbers on it because it, it, it really is context specific, right? Yeah, uh, what was your question? If you could do that or not. But yeah, really right. yeah, not really. Um, though you can estimate power through this. Yeah. All right, and then the hazard ratio. Um, and so where I talked about hazard before, the hazard ratio is used a lot in estimating survival functions. And what you're doing is you're just comparing the likelihood of a thing happening at that time to one group or one subset of your data to another group. And that ratio now defines um, is the statistic you're interested in. So you want to say like, 
is it two times more likely for people in this one group versus the people in this other group to experience a failure at time t, right? So, um, nope, I passed it here. So here, that would amount to like, oh, okay, so it seems like maybe two times more likely, like they're, they're facing a much higher hazard uh, in this group than this group, right? At any, or it's particularly here, their hazard ratio is going to be very high here um, uh, in this group relative to this group. So you're just comparing them. It's a way to bench it in uh, a comparison between your two groups. And it's actually a different way. Sorry, I, I will totally answer it. It's a different way of comparing them than the log rank test, actually. So, yeah. Yeah, the fam. So all the drops are observed, like we've seen that that share of this group has experienced an event. Um, so anywhere there's a black dot, um, sorry, so which one, like this one, for example, or yeah. this one? So these two are, I mean, uh, I get this one over there, for example, mm -hmm. that we're pointing out right now, right? Okay. But in the first case, that you have the first drop, mm -hmm. there is no immediate black so there's no black, the black dots, um, they're randomly um, scattered along this curve. Okay. Yeah, so they don't correspond with any of the drops. Mm -hmm. uh, they actually correspond with a lack of a drop uh, because you just haven't seen anything happen okay. at that point. Does that? Yeah. Yeah, yeah if, you have not, it, if, if you, you haven't have observed it. something, how do you know where it goes? Like, why does it vary on each? Point oh, on? because this is where we stop seeing uh, data on this person. And so we know that they're up to that point, they're having nothing happen. So now we can support that like in this group, nothing happens up to that point. And so it's, it's all about adding information um, to the model, right? But it's incomplete information, so it won't, it won't support a drop there. So ideally you would have no black dots. Ideally, yes. Yeah. Ideally, you have no missing data ever in similar network fusion, survival analysis, yeah, writ large. <laughs> yeah. What do you want with black dots if we like correlate to the survival analysis and the survival analysis? Are they like one person? Because I guess when you start out with 100 people and then 50% of them get censored, then you have an event, so the job, like someone dies, mm -hmm. so then the job would be a lot bigger than if you had still 99 people. Yeah. Yeah, so if you have a lot of censored data, so now you, you're you just like, you're cutting down your denominator, right? If you think about it as a fraction. And so, yeah, each drop will be much bigger because now your drop, your drop just uh, corresponds to the proportion of people in that group who are uh, experiencing failure or dying or what have you. So, yeah, exactly. If you have a lot of black dots, now each drop is larger uh, in that group. So each black dot is an independent person. Yes. It's not the same. It's a different person. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So the hazard ratio. All right. And so the reason the hazard ratio is very important is because it's used in the Cox proportional hazards uh, model. Um, and so what this does, what this model does is it, it estimates the ratio of risks for your groups relative to each other. Um, and so we can do this on a continuous scale. So it can say, as you age, how does your hazard uh, ratio increase? So you can compare distinct, like uh, a 50 year old to a 10 year old, right? In terms of their uh, hazard rate. Um, but you can also do it for subtypes. So you can directly take your subtyping data, like we talked about before with the gene expression subtyping, or, or if you have SNF subtypes that you've developed, and you can put those in as individual groups, and you can compare their um, hazard to each other. And it has a really nice parametric form. Um, or it's uh, Sorry, it's non-parametric. Uh, but it has a nice form that allows you to estimate really nice confidence intervals and smooth functions that describe how important, for example, age, a continuous value, is to your survival. Or more importantly, your hazard, so your likelihood of non-survival at any given time. 
Um, so some intuition. So here, uh, here's actually the model. Um, what you have is this baseline hazard value. So this H sub zero and with T in it, um, this is the baseline hazard. This is a single value that is shared across everyone. So the reason it's H sub zero and not H sub I is that it doesn't differentiate between individual people. Everyone has the same baseline hazard. And the idea is the only thing that differentiates them are their relative risk based on all the covariates that you're giving your model. And so these are all very important to keep in mind. And we're going to talk about evaluating these actual assumptions um, in your data when we go to modeling um, our survival data. Um, and so this beta here represents a logged hazard ratio. Um, so see, it uh, exists up in the exponent here. Um, and it says, how likely is it that you're going to have, um, if you have one unit increase, in uh, some predictor, how much will your hazard fold likelihood change? Um, you have an in one unit increase in the subgroup. Right. So for that, what you do is you have a baseline subtype, and you compare everything to that one subtype. And so then you would have a different beta value for membership in each subtype group. So for categorical data. But for age, right, it would just be like one year. Yeah. How does that change your hazard? Um, and the hazard ratio increase here, so it says for one unit, then your hazard ratio will increase by the exponent of that single predictor or that single parameter. Um, and if it's uh, less than zero, of course, you'll have your hazard reducing. If it's greater than zero, um, your hazard will be increasing. So... So when you're comparing them, the nice thing about having it in the exponent, and this is what I was talking about, um, incorrectly calling it parametric, but uh, here what you can use is the fact that it's in the exponent, you're just subtracting them from each other. So now it becomes like a typical uh, regression model um, in terms of your interpretation um, differentiating the two. Um, and so it can be interpreted as a percentage change in risk. So um, if you have your hazard ratio, um, is 0.8, it means you have a 20% decre decrease in mortality risk with that one unit increase in whatever your predictor was. So it's a really nice, uh, clean interpretation. Um, so for evaluating these models and evaluating their fit, there's actually a lot of different ways to do it. Um, and this is one of them uh, that I, I'd like to talk about just because this is really unique to survival data. Um, and it's concordance index. And so when you're, whenever you fit predictive models, you want to see how well your model is predicting people and placing them in, um, in their respective places. Uh, I'm trying to say how well it predicts the true values for those people. Um, and so here, what's interesting is if you're trying to build a predictive model, you may or may not be interested in order, but if you're doing um, cost proportional hazards, you're pretty confined to this. So the parametric models, if you're interested in putting and predicting when something will happen, you'll more likely want to go to a parametric model than a concordance index, because what a concordance index will tell you is, did I put everybody back in the correct order? And sometimes order is less important than the time. Right? Because order doesn't correspond to when something happened. It corresponds to when did something happen relative to everybody else. Right? And so, um, yeah, so no other metric captures the ordering in, of individuals. But if you're not interested in the ordering of individuals or you're interested in the time or something else, then you'll really want to think about what model you're creating um, and what model you're trying to predict from uh, because this may not be appropriate. Like Cox proportional hazards may not be appropriate. I know I'm talking about a lot about like when these models break and when things don't work, but uh, I just like to do that because I feel like it's easy to give a talk where it's like, this is great, this is useful, all of this, but the pitfalls, I think, end up being some of the most important things uh, for actually using everything. So, um, so here's an example of where SNF, I cluster, and then the PAM50 clusters uh, were used to try to predict um, survival. Um, and this is the concordance index here that I talked about. So we were just trying to say, like, can we just order these patients? Can we predict when this will occur relative to everyone else, when um, they will die, actually, relative to everyone else? Um, and what we found was uh, we were able to marginally improve on it um, here, but 
this also speaks to is it maybe more appropriate to use the data in a continuous space? So in this paper, what uh, we did um, was we actually used the full network, and this is where having a fully connecting network is very important. You don't have to draw those divisions between the different groups in that fused network. You can use the full network to actually inform your predict predictions. Excuse me. So here what they did was they just propagated the patient through the network, which means that you take a patient, you say, who in the network are you most similar to? Um, and then you place them with those people and say, can now we predict the order based on who these people are the most similar to, just in a very simple framework. And what we found was we are actually able to make a massive gain, relatively speaking, um, in our predictive accuracy um, by using all of that information. So sometimes dividing people into subtypes, you're actually throwing away a lot of information that's very important um, for what's going on. Um, so just another thing to think about, uh, whenever you're doing a, creating a distance matrix or an affinity matrix or anything, that's actually a fully connected network that you may be able to use for your study and you don't have to cut them into the different groups. So sometimes groups are really important and really useful and sometimes they're just not and uh, you do much better uh, including all the information. Yeah? So you tried to explain how I should interpret that number 0.7 yeah, so 72% of the patients were placed in the correct order relative to, yeah, and 28% uh, were out of order. Okay. And that was survival. Yes, yeah. yeah, so we ordered the death, yeah. per, like, uh, correctly. But the thing is, again, like, if I, like, as a patient, right, if I'm looking for a prediction tool to know when I'm going to have a cancer, like cancer onset or death or something, I'm much more interested in knowing at what age I'm going to die versus, yeah, or yeah, exactly, versus am I going to die before or after my colleague here, right? So, um, <laughs> like, and that's really, at the end of the day, that's, that is what is being predicted here and shown here. So it's another thing to just think about, like, what is, what is the meaning behind this? And are people really interested in that? And, and would you be even as a patient or a physician? Um, so, uh, data integration in the future and now. Um, so, simultaneous feature selection and data integration is something that's an active area of research. So, uh, by feature selection, I mean going through the data and picking out what's most important, filtering uh, your um, individual metrics. So, uh, maybe you're filtering genes or filtering methylation probes or filtering certain microRNA at the same time as integrating that data among each other. So. Um, that's an active area of research right now. Uh, also supervised versus unsupervised approaches. There's um, like an SNF kind of flavored supervised uh, clustering approach. Um, but at the end of the day, so the, the very basic problem of SNF is there's no objective function to optimize our parameters over. So we cannot do it in a supervised fashion. And anything that's done in a supervised fashion for the most part is usually some linear combination. And so it's not quite concatenation and clustering, but at the end of the day, it is kind of a linear combination concatenation and cluster. So um, it's uh, one area of research is trying to escape linearity while um, getting supervised clustering. And then uh, weights for contributions of different types of data. So I'm glad you brought that up. Um, we weight them the same right now. We're not sure. I haven't really come across a case where it makes sense to upweight or downweight some uh, data type because uh, usually we're doing it, uh, we're running SNF in a context where we don't know what's most important and we really want everything to have an equal vote um, in terms of what's important. So um, it's something we've thought about um, and, you know, uh, maybe you guys will have cases where it does make sense and we'd love to hear about that. Yes? Could it be that one kind of data would be more important in one different research, in one research question, but another kind of data would be important oh, definitely. in another research question? So for yeah. example, let's say you wanted to take cancer early on. Yeah. There, there are not that many mutations yet, so the DNA methylation pattern would maybe be more appropriate to use because that's an early onset in cancer. Yeah. But later, if you wanted 
to predict therapy, you might go for mutations because they are more predicting of Absolutely, yeah. And the other thing is, um, we kind of want to discover what's most important on the face of it. So, so that's actually a great example. We work um, in leaf romani syndrome, uh, so studying patients who have a germline p53 mutation. Um, and I just want to show, you know, um, but the thing is, uh, if something's not important, so like um, your SNBs, right? Uh, we, we expect it to just show up like this. Like we expect the data to tell us that it's not important. It's not differentiating, any, differentiating anyone. So that's the other reason why like pre-weighting everything by our own biases, um, it doesn't necessarily make sense in this context, um, for us, but yeah, very like, yeah, but like, it's, it's like an extremely good point. Like in some scenarios, it may be important and others it's not. And it's really context specific, but also you also would hope that your data just shows that. And yeah. so you don't have to bias it, um, upstream. Yeah. yeah. Okay. So we're on, um, Can I ask a practical question? absolutely. Yeah. Uh, so, uh, in a real life scenario where you have to, to do the actual analysis, yeah. uh, KM versus Cox, where would you use to, I always do a KM first. Like, that's a first pass. It's like everyone will recognize it. Everyone will understand it. Like, it's immediately interpretable. And then from the KM model, um, it's more of a, a question of Cox versus um, a parametric survival model. And with that, it's it comes down to, like, what do you care about? Do you care about ordering people? Or do you care, or do you care about hazard over, like, a different time point? Because the hazard function may be very interesting as well. Um, or do you care about when is this going to happen? Like at what age or at what time uh, interval do I expect some failure or some onset of cancer or what have you? Yeah. Okay. So that's all I have for the lecture. Mm -hmm.